Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built. And last week you saw me get the pedals and steering wheel into the location that I'm happy with. This week, I think we need to try and actually get this steering connected up. Hey guys, welcome back. And those of you who've been watching for a while know that this is the Frankenholder. So the chassis and running gear and everything are from a Toyota Costa bus. And the body is a 1954 1954 Ford F600 truck uh, that I'm gonna be building a, uh, a bit of a tricky sort of uh, tilt tray car carrier thing on the back. Um, if you missed the uh, last episode where I was setting everything up, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up. And like always, do the things like subscribe and comment. It all helps out that algorithm. A few comments from last week. Um, I've been getting lots of comments all the time of like, why don't I just get a, a, a Land Cruiser brake booster and pedals or something from another car? The thing is, is that it's not necessarily going to fit and be ergonomically in the right spot anyway. And one of the big things I mentioned earlier with this cab is that it doesn't have a lot of foot room. So it's really only good for small people like myself. It's quite a common modification to extend the footwell in these cabs to get a bit more room so taller people can drive it. And uh, I want this to be uh, available for me to use, but also my mates, if they need to uh, uh, move a car around or whatever, it's, it's, it's going to be a workhorse that uh, needs to fit a lot of people and I didn't want to just make a, uh, something that, uh, you know, you have to be me and, and it only fits me and nobody else. Um, and, and like I mentioned, even if I got a booster that would sat through the firewall, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything would have been in the right spot and it doesn't mean that it would have been less fabrication. So there's, there's still so much fabrication that was necessary anyway. Um, and I already had the parts. I didn't have to buy anything. I didn't have to go and like track them down and search and waste time finding parts. Getting parts is really difficult and really time consuming and it's all there. So the parts that I can get easily, I'll get, but uh, otherwise I can make it. So that's what I've done and uh, reusing the parts instead of just throwing away, I'm much happier about doing that. Just one or two other points. There are a couple of people who mentioned that um, are wondering why I don't use riv nuts. Uh, I've been through this in, um, in previous projects and I've mentioned it before. Um, I've welded in captive nuts and I much prefer captive nuts over riv nuts. Riv nuts have their place um, if you've already got a, uh, a nice finished panel and you just uh, you want to mount something into something that's nice and neat and painted, you can drill a hole and put them in there as long as it's nothing relied on too much for its strength. I find the issue with riv nuts is that um, they can, uh, particularly if they're exposed to uh, you know, water or, or anything in behind, they can corrode and you, if you're bolt gets even slightly stuck in there, you put a little bit too much torque on it, you can actually spin the riv nut in place and it just ends up being this thing you've got to try and cut off and it's it's awkward and complicated. Um, captive nuts, if, you've, if you're working from scratch uh, with a welder, it's way quicker to put a captive nut in than it is to, to mess around with a riv nut. It's so quick and easy to just weld in a captive nut. It's stronger, it's gonna stay. So that is my position on captive nuts. Only other things I can remember, um, people asking about uh, the collapsible steering column and the Toyota Coaster has a collapsible steering column. That is one of the things that engineers look for when you're doing modifications like this, that you need a, um, a, a column that basically collapses in a crash. The issues with uh, um, vehicles of this vintage is often they had a, a solid steering shaft that uh, basically is a big spear heading straight at the driver. You get in a front end collision and often the, the, uh, the steering shaft could sort of come through, punch through the steering wheel and just, yeah, it's not a good day for anyone. So this has a collapsible steering shaft and it's also going to be multiple pieces. So it's not going to be a big issue. So uh, all that said, let's take you in here and show you what I'm currently dealing with and uh, let's see what we can go from there. All right, so last week um, I ended up putting my steering column in and this is where my steering shaft comes out. Now, it's a two-piece steering shaft from the Toyota Coaster that used to go basically sort of straight down 
to this uh, this steering box that I have relocated slightly further backwards on the chassis and uh, and now have it here ready to accept the steering. But I need to get this to join to this over here. Now, difficult part about playing with steering is that uh, it's it's not legal to cut and weld steering components in Australia. Well, actually, technically it is legal. You can cut and weld steering components, but uh, you then have to get sent it away and get it uh, x-rayed and checked and certified that it's uh, strong enough and of the standard, and obviously that's a big, uh, a big headache. But there are components that you can get that are engineering legal, um, you know, they've already been tested and proved to be safe enough so you can actually use them. And that's what I've got here, is I've got these universal joints that are, as I mentioned, engineered, tested, and legal. This one in particular goes from the Toyota Spline, which I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think it's a 36 by 17 Spline or something, I can't even remember. Uh, that goes from the Toyota Spline, which is on the, uh, the steering shaft, to uh, a double D shackle spine. It's a bit of round stock with two flats on it. Um, and this is deemed legal as well. So this piece of Toyota steering spline will be able to be used to join up the bottom of this shaft to a universal joint to double D shaft going from those two to connect it all up and get it all so that the, the steering flows through. The issue is, is that then there's too many universal joints in line. You can't have more than two universal joints um, without support in between and a solid base, otherwise they'll just flop around everywhere in the middle. So I need to add my rod end in up here and secure it in place so that this is locked in and everything will stay in one location. The issue is, is that rod end is designed for the internal diameter of the, the double D shaft, not the spine. So let's make a sleeve up so that it will keep everything nice and firm and secure and uh, we can join this all up. So the rod ends I'm using are from the same place as the universal joints and they are engineered and legal to use in a steering application. And uh, what I've got here is I've got a bit of stainless steel rod that I'm turning down to make the spacer between the Toyota spline and the rod end because uh, as I said, they're made to fit the double D shaft. And I'm just realizing how hard it is to work with stainless steel as uh, my cutoff bar is actually melting on the edge of the stainless steel and I had to switch to another one to actually be able to cut off my sleeve. Now I've got my sleeve, I can start to try and mock everything up, work out the rough lengths and angles and things like that. And I need a mount for my rod end. So that's what I'm doing here is using a big thick piece of angle iron to make a solid mount for the rod end. Now I've marked my double D shaft to get the right length, cut it off and uh, connect it all up so I can see if it actually works. So I made a nice neat stainless steel sleeve that sits inside my rod end. The rod end I've made a bracket and uh, just tacked it onto the back of the booster and uh, that is connected up to my universal joints and all the rest. The issue is, is because this is a rod end and not a solid end, it is actually still allowing movement. So that is obviously moving way more than it, it should. So I'm gonna need to work out a way to place another rod end here and get it here so that the whole thing is rock solid. So as you can see, as I turn the steering wheel, you can see how much everything sort of jumps around and that's not what we want. So I take the shaft off and add in the second rod end so I get an idea of the location and now it's time to start making up another bracket. Once I've got everything close, I just tack it in and let's see if it works. All right, that is nice and smooth steering and I can go all the way from lock to lock 
and it's, uh, oh yeah, that's buttery. That is good. So uh, this is still, obviously you can see it sort of wobbling around. This is just tacked together for the time being. But by having the, uh, the two eyelets here, everything can just move the way it's supposed to. And uh, yeah, we have nice smooth steering. So that I am happy with, but this uh, sort of dodgy connection I've got here needs a little work, but we can, uh, we can tidy that up. Now that I know where everything needs to be, let's make it pretty. So here I'm making up a bit of reinforcement for the bracket for the second rod end. And um, yeah, after looking at this, in the future, these brackets will actually be coming off and it'll be held in separately. But uh, that's something for a future video. Because if it's worth doing, it's worth doing twice. Okay, so you see here that I've made a whole reinforcement. There's still plenty of travel for the brake pedal. The brake pedal at full, at full bump is uh, still miles away from touching. So that is going to work quite nicely for what I need. And uh, I'll just leave that tacked together for the time being. Next thing I want to do is uh, I want to mock up the new drag link that I need to make. And uh, that is that there. So basically what I need to do is I need to uh, remove this and then we need to cut this. I'm gonna sleeve it and uh, uh, weld it back together shorter as a template for the company to build me a new one. So I really hate undoing tie rod ends. They're always so difficult to get off and uh, I'm using some penetrant and a tie rod removal tool. And even still, the amount of tension that you need to put on this tool before it actually lets go is crazy. Wow. Yeah, when they let go, they really let go with some force. So I know the length I want my final drag link, so I'm cutting a big section out of the center of it. And I have a length of three mil wall steel tube that fits over the top. And I'm using that as a sleeve to tie the drag link together. Now going through and drilling a bunch of holes into my sleeve so that I can go through and plug weld the whole way along and get it nice and strong. This is a temporary solution but at least it will be well and truly strong enough for me to move the truck around while I'm finishing the build. And with a couple of tacks I found at full lock the lock stop was actually getting in the way. Now I have a very slightly different angle on the drag link. I had to actually remove the lock stop and I'll have to make a new lock stop for the right hand lock in the future. All right, we have wheels that uh, do wheel things. Like we have a steering wheel that turns the wheels of the truck. So. Um, yeah, that is all connected. It's only just tacked in there with that uh, that sleeve. I said this is just for mock-up, but I'm still doing all of the uh, the plug welds and everything to make sure that it is nice and secure for testing. Uh, I can then get that made properly later. Um, so I think now we need to take it off and start welding it up. While the drag leaks in place, I just add a couple extra tacks and then I'll take it over to the bench. So I ensured I actually had holes in the center of my tube so I can actually weld the two ends of the drag link together through the holes and then plug weld as well all the way over the top, tying it into the sleeve. Just to add some extra strength. Now I'm making sure I connect the earth lead to the center of the sleeve rather than trying to make the the arc travel through the ends of the rod ends, then it could actually damage the uh, the rod ends internally. When you're welding, the the arc is always going to go through the 
path of least resistance. So it's going to go directly from your torch to whatever you're using and then uh, straight to the earth lead. So it's not really going to affect the rod ends that are already on there. And while I'm here, I'm happy with where the steering box is now, so I'm going to fully weld in the crush tubes of where I mounted that steering box a few weeks ago. I give it a quick grind back of the welds and a coat of black just to make it look a little bit nicer and stop it from rusting while it's in the mock-up phase. All right, we have a truck that steers and uh, yeah, turns the steering wheel. Now, I still, obviously this will have power steering that's gonna be reconnected up and all the rest of it, but uh, we have a steering wheel that does steering wheel things. We have a brake pedal in the right place. We have a clutch pedal in the right place. So I think next thing we need to tackle is the accelerator. All right, so here is the original accelerator pedal. Now this originally mounted to the side of the uh, the bus something like so and uh, in an angle something like this and the cable went down and under and back to the engine. Now in my case this is, uh, it's, it, I can't make it go through the floor just here because that is actually where the wheel travels so I need to keep that space clear. Uh, also now my engine is no longer behind the steering wheel, it's actually in front so I really want my cable going in a different direction instead of going out this way, I want it to go out that way. So what I think I need to do is I need to cut off the pedal and re-weld it on. Now I'm going to still use the same um, basic bracketry because it has the stops, it travels the correct distance, all that sort of stuff is all there. Um, so that is what I'm going to attempt to do now is try and work out exactly where to put it and then make up a bracket to fix it in the right spot. So like I did with the clutch and brake setup, it's a lot of sort of trial and error and just trying to roughly get things in the right spot to start with before you can make any solid mount. So this is all temporary mock-up at this stage. All right, so after a bit of work, I actually have an accelerator pedal that's in roughly the right spot. I had to put a big hole in the firewall to get the sort of the bracketry through for the cable, which again uh, can be covered up later. The cable currently is uh, extra long going all the way around to where, the, uh, where it currently is. It doesn't need to be anywhere near as long as it used to. All right, well, I'm, I'm reasonably happy now with the pedal placement, the steering wheel placement. I have steering that is actually connected to the front wheels. I have, uh, yeah, the, the brakes and most of the controls are in place. The accelerator pedal is close, but not quite right. But uh, I am not going to get it perfectly in spot this week because I'm out of time. So I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, the very first trucks made by Ford were in 1917 with the model TT. So Ford supplied the chassis with the buyer supplying the body. The Ford TT was basically the same as the Model T but with a 25 inch longer wheelbase. The first year only three Model TTs were produced but World War I was raging and in 1918 Ford supplied the US Army with 12,000 trucks. The Model TT had a worm drive and crown wheel on its rear axle, as opposed to the Model T, which had a crown wheel and a pinion. This meant the Model TT was very durable, but slow, with a recommended top speed of 25 kilometers per hour. These trucks were produced for 10 years, and by the end of its production run in 1927, over one and a half million had been produced. All right, we have steering connected, we have the pedal, like we getting there on the controls of this truck. I am very happy with the uh, the sort of the speed at which this is coming together. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's just, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're this seeing is... the fruits of your labor. That's right. Mm. And uh, I think we're almost there on the alpha as far as the uh, engineering goes. I've got the draft report. I've just got to uh, get back to them. So finally, um, we're very, we're getting very close to getting the alpha on the road. It's just been uh, waiting on the backlog of the engineer, which is, uh, 
Yes, it's just uh, waiting is the hard bit, but we're getting there. <laughs> Patience, young grasshopper. <laughs> I don't know what I said that. Um, <laughs> like and subscribe, let Jeff know what you think. Uh, Patreon, always super appreciative. And I you think get to see the videos a day early without ads. ads. And I think that's everything. But All right, guys. See you soon. See you next time. The very first trucks made by Ford were produced in 1917. And they were called the Model Ford TT. No. Yeah. <laughs> the Model TT had a worm drive and a crown axle on its rear pinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. Neither can I. <laughs>